Good morning. My name is Beth Gillespie, and I am a member of Westminster's social justice ministry team. We build the social justice forums around a common theme. And this program year, our theme is diving deeper together so all will flourish. This theme builds on our heightened awareness of the systemic and critical issues affecting our community, brought to greater attention in recent years, most especially in response to the murder of George Floyd. Through the forums, we will learn about long-standing needs and become more prepared to support the flourishing of all members of our community. Today, we welcome Dr. Makari Trainum, who will be addressing how we can interrupt myths around social movements and understand ourselves. Dr. Trainum started her career as a teacher and was both a principal and a district leader before moving to her current job as the director of the Minnesota Department of Education's Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Center. So as we move through the forum, when we get to the time for questions, if you are here with us in the Meisel room, you can raise your hand and I will bring you the microphone. We wanna make sure the questions go into the microphone so those joining us on the live stream can also hear the questions. If you are joining us via live stream, please go ahead and put your questions into the chat and we will be monitoring the chat and make sure to share your questions or comments with the room here. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Makari Trainum. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and happy Sunday, right? It's nice to be here. I heard that 8.30, you guys had your first um, virtual, was it the virtual 8.30 service? Two, yeah. And so then you guys will have service after this. So I'm really excited about the service for 8.30 this morning that was able to happen. So thank you so much for in, um, inviting me to be here. And so I kind of had created this as a little bit of a workshop, but as I thought about it and between folks online listening and then being here, I was like, I'm going to just kind of adjust. That's what I was trying to do with these few little minutes was kind of adjust. Um, but we're going to just be talking about this idea of becoming anti-racist. And I, I like the terminology of becoming because it's really about what we are striving to do. It's an action that we are doing every single day. You never arrive, right? It's never this thing of like, I am that. I am there, but rather this is what I'm striving to be because I make mistakes along the way. Um, as we see times change, uh, various things happen. And so when those things are happening, we have to just be mindful of how that influences us. I always like to start with quotes because quotes are really grounding. Um, from my perspective, it allows for us to really think deeper about what it is that we're going to uh, start to engage in, the why to that. Um, and so I uh, brought in Ibram Kendi's work in particular, because many of you might be familiar with his book, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, I typically promote his first book, um, which is Stamped from the Beginning, which I think is really the starting point for most of us to really understand where do these racist ideologies come from? Because they didn't just come from nowhere. And as we get further in our um, discussion today, you'll just kind of see, specifically uh, when we talk about the United States, the history that we've had of these ideologies that have just permeated through centuries with an S. And so one of the things that he says is that racist is not a pejorative, right? It's not a pejorative. It's not the worst word in the English language. It is not the equivalent of a slur. So I want to just pause there for a minute. I want you to think about when you've heard the word being used. If the word has ever been used against you, how has it made you feel? and start to think about what he's saying. It's not a slur, okay? It is descriptive, and the only way to undo racism is to constantly identify and describe it, and then dismantle it. Meaning if we're unwilling to have the conversation, if we're unwilling to really engage in it, we can change nothing. Um, I use the idea of if someone is ill, right? If you get a diagnosis, um, that of some, you might have something that is terminal, you don't want the doctor to come in and to just be like, you know, you're a little bit ill, but you know, it's gonna be okay, right? You wanna know what's going on, what's happening so that you can do something about it if you're able to. And that's what this is about. I wanna know so that we can do something about it. He goes on to say the attempt to turn this usefully descriptive term into an almost unusable slur is of course designed to do the opposite. It's to freeze us into inaction. So if I use this term, 
if I'm offended by this term, the likelihood of me doing anything about it is reduced, right? I'm gonna be more focused on what you called me than is there an action that happened that brought this thinking forward? And so we have to be willing to interrogate and to be reflective about what's going on, what happened. And I say this as a black woman, a former principal, former assistant principal, uh, where I have dealt with students. Uh, when I, I was a, a principal in, in Oregon, Portland, Oregon, uh, for about 11 years, I was an administrator there. And I never forget having students call me an Uncle Tom. And I was like, what? Right? It was this like, and for me, I'm thinking, I'm always, like, I'm the most down, you know, like, I get it. I would, but I had to stop and really think about what did I say? What am I doing that would cause for them to believe that I am not supporting them, that I am doing something that's more harmful than helpful? And that takes a lot to do, right? Our instinct is to push back and to say, I'm a good person. Oh, that's not, that's not who I am. The real work is being able to say, okay, what part of this might be true? What am I doing that's actually um, maintaining systems of inequity, that's actually maintaining things that are hurtful to groups of people? And those are things that I've done over the course of my time in doing this work that I always say I never allow for people to call me an expert. I simply say I am practicing. Right? It's a constant work of practice, which means that I'm constantly growing. Um, and I encourage you that as you're doing this work to use words that really encourage people to understand that there is no arrival point. This is a constant movement in process. Are there any thoughts that come up for you when you see and read this quote? Any thoughts? I like his idea of saying racism is a descriptive word, but I feel like our whole society would not accept that. I mean, it's a big uphill battle, I think, to get people to think of that word um, in that way. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with that. Thank you for that. This idea of it being descriptive is really built off of one of the things he says in the book um, is that you know, most people who are white supremacists will not call themselves racist. They don't see themselves in that way. And they would tell you, I'm not racist. So if we, if we can say that white supremacists don't see themselves as racist, the question, um, Edward uh, Bonilla uh, uh, Silva wrote a book called, in essence, uh, Where Are All the Racists, right? If nobody's racist, who's racist, right? And so we have to constantly be asking that question. Well, if nobody is, then who is? And how is it that we can say, for example, um, that people can be misogynistic, right? And we can, we can use that terminology easily, but we struggle with this idea of racism. And I think what's important for us to really know about um, the use of the word racist, racism, is that it's typically, when we think of those words, we think of the most extreme measure. We think of the KKK, we think of the skinheads, we think, right, we think of extremist groups and we say that's who those people are. Those are the ones, right? And so then it's not me, right? And so because I can see them in that, I will not associate myself in that. And to call me that becomes deeply hurtful, right? And, it's, and you start to say, well, I'm a good person. I wouldn't do, I, I love everybody, right? Not a bone in my body. How many times have we heard that, right, in the apologies, the non-apologies that we've heard from people? Not a bone in my body, but there's no examination of what brought this forward. I remind people, um, just using lynching as an example, boarding schools, Native American boarding schools, that these were things that were set up with intent, right? When you think of the Native American boarding school, the intent was to kill the native, save the man. But if the idea is to kill the native, what does that mean? It means that you've already determined that something isn't right about them. You've already said that their culture, who they are, their very being is not right and we have to fix it. And that fix it is removing their culture in order to assimilate them into a dominant perspective, right? The same becomes true with lynching. When we think about lynchings, when you see those pictures, those weren't white supremacists who were standing around watching, those were children who were there, right? You had children, you had your local grocer 
You had your local officer. You had your local pastor, in many cases, who were there. These were just regular folk who would never say in a million years that they were racist. So we associate something with ideologies that is really part of the air we breathe. So keep that in mind as we go forward. The two things that I want us to talk about, or that I'm going to talk about today, and try to move through quickly so we can get through to questions, um, is this idea of understanding ourselves, this navigation. How do we navigate and see and understand the world? Who am I within this process? And then the second part is this idea of interrupting myths. What does it take to really do this work? How do I need to really understand um, when I'm thinking of the, the wanting justice, wanting to move towards racial and social justice, is this something that um, is a sprint? We're going to get there. Listen, George Floyd was, was murdered a, a year ago, and you know what? A year later, this should be fixed, right? Is it that, or is it something else? And so I want to just kind of bring that forward as thought, because the way that I see this work is not so much about changing people. Your job isn't to change them. In the same way that we think about knowing who Jesus is, his job wasn't to change us. His job was to give us an offering of, have you considered this? And if you consider this, this could change your life. But ultimately, the choice is whose? Ours. It's our own individual choice to be changed. And so I see us as influencers more than anything else. Your work is to influence and to give people options for something that they haven't considered. Okay, so I'm going to just use this quote. Yesterday I was clever. This is from Rumi. Yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today I am wise, so I'm changing myself. Our work starts with us. It is an individual first and a collective second. What do I do? How am I interrogating? How am I paying attention to my own issues and the way that I maintain systems, because we all do it. I can talk about many ways as a principal, as an administrator, as a teacher, that I maintain systems. The very systems that I was like, this is hurting kids. But I still did it in a way that it didn't seem like I was doing it, but I was. So we always have to start with ourselves first. My mom always says, when you're pointing that one finger out, there's three coming back at you, right? So if I'm pointing this way, I better have done it three times on myself, okay? So how we navigate? We navigate through our values and beliefs. We navigate through our identity. And we navigate through our culture. This is how we see, we engage, we understand the world that's around us. It's why there can be an accident out here on the street. All of us could be standing there, and we could easily have different stories that we tell because we see things differently based on our experiences, based on who we interact with, based on where we've been. All of those things um, impact us. So let's start with values and beliefs. I usually give like an inventory uh, that Elena Aguilar has from her book, the, um, the Art of Coaching. And there's typically like about 115 words. You can always add to it. But I'll ask people to go through and start with 10. Identify the 10 values that you hold. And then after they've done that, I say, I now I want you to narrow those 10 to five. And after they've narrowed those five, I then say narrow to three. And then I ask, I want you to think about how you got to your three most important values, the things that are most salient to you. Why did you get there? How did you get there? And ultimately, what it is is it's talking about like what you believe in, right? Here's what I believe. Here's what's important to me. Here's what I just can't let go of. Here's what I made sure my children know. And so what I often ask after all that's been done is I say, OK, so now that you've identified these, I want you to think about the way that you embody and enact those values. So for example, if you chose integrity, Integrity is what's really important to me. I'm, I got to make sure that that happens. I say two things, especially when I'm working with professionals. One, holding integrity doesn't stop when you walk through your work doors, right? You're not like, well, when I'm outside and it's on my own personal time, 
Integrity is important to me. But now that I've come to work, I'm setting that aside and just do as you do, right? That's not how we do. If we believe that integrity is important to us, we take that both personally and professionally in our workplaces and in our personal lives. That's how we're living it. So the question becomes, how do you enact integrity? How do you know that someone is, is holding integrity? So I'm gonna give two stories. One is mine, and it's about my kids. And I didn't realize that listening was actually an important thing to me. I wouldn't say that it's the most important, but it clearly is an important thing for me. And so I'm at the table with my girls, my husband and I, we're having dinner and I'm chastising them, probably about not cleaning up, right? That's more than likely what it is. And so I'm looking at my girls, my oldest is looking at me and she's nodding and she's like, yeah, mom, you know, mm -hmm. and my youngest is continuing to eat and she's like peeling her lima beans one by one, right? And popping them in her mouth and going to the next one. And I'm looking at her and I'm like, she is not listening to me, right? Like she is not listening. And so in my mind, I'm thinking as soon as I'm done, I'm going to tell her to tell me what I just said. So I finished saying everything that I say, and when I'm done, I'm like, Layla, what did I just say? And she's like, oh, well, you said, and she tells me everything that I said. And you said that we need, and she keeps, and I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> thank you, thank you, right? Okay, clearly she was listening. But as I'm going to bed, I turn to my husband, and I'm like, I bet you it was our oldest child that wasn't listening to me, right? Like, so even though she's nodding, and mm-hmm, mom, the odds of her paying attention was probably slim compared to my daughter. And I made the assumption that the youngest wasn't listening because she wasn't nodding, she wasn't engaged in the way that I see engagement. And it was at that moment that I realized, oh, that's how I expect other people to behave to show that they're listening, right? This is the behavior that I expect. And I had to start paying attention to when I'm doing that. I had a, a participant years ago, as we were doing an activity, um, say that integrity was really important to her. And she said, the way that I know that people hold integrity is because they look me in the eye when I'm talking to them. That's how I know they hold integrity. And I was like, oh. Now that can be problematic. Because there's lots of cultures that showing respect and showing integrity is not looking you in the eye. It's actually looking down. And so if I believe the way that integrity shows up, the way that I carry it, the way that I embody it, the way I expect other people to do it, is that you're looking me in the eye, then I have just marginalized them in a very real way. So it's important for us to think about our beliefs and values are important, very important, but how we enact them can be marginalizing if we're not careful. It can be oppressive if we're not careful. And so you wanna think about what are my values and how do they show up and is that okay? Does it make room for people to be who they are? The next is our identity. Our identity is shaped through our experiences, our values, our beliefs, our environment, as well as our culture. And this is just a small example um, of an identity wheel that kind of points out different ways by which we can identify things, again, that are important to us. I would say that from an identity perspective, before I had children, being a mom wasn't like a really important thing to me, right? I was living the life of a childless couple, my husband and I. It was a fabulous life, right? <laughs> living and doing as you want to do, when you want to do it. So there was value there in just being able to do what you want to do when you want to do it. But once we became parents, that changed, right? Being able to do what I want to do when I want to do it shifted. And it wasn't about me anymore, right? It was about them. So that part of my identity changed. So you have to think about <clears throat> who are you? What are the things that's really important? If you're a feminist or you believe in feminism, you might say that gender identity is really important to you, right? Being a woman is really important. And it shapes how I see the world, how I see inequities, how I see things for my own daughters, right? So this becomes really important in how we see, engage, and understand in the world. And so it's important for you to think about 
what are the salient pieces of my identity? How does Makari, um, as an African-American um, female, no, I should say gender, so female, um, and family, and maybe even political be beliefs and education, how does that impact the way that I engage? Did I do something? The way that I see things, the way that I believe an inequity is taking place or not taking place. These things matter. So understanding where you're at as far as your identity is concerned, and not every identity is up there, but where your identity is and how that shapes the way that you see the world is important. And last is gonna be culture. We're all born into a culture. And most often the culture that we're most familiar with is right up here. Food and dress and music. When we talk about having a multicultural day or a multicultural fair, we are celebrating these things here, right? The celebration, the games, oh, beautiful dress, whatever that is. But culture is deeper than that. It's deeper than that. It's how we behave in groups. It's how we consider and, and believe that we should treat our elders. It's about the tone of voice. Boy, I can tell you, in the African-American community, tone of voice matters, right? These are things that are deeper that we don't necessarily see, but they are part of how we engage. It's part of our ways of being. And oftentimes, they can, they can be hidden from us. I say to folks um, from a work perspective, when you say, you know, I'm not really sure what our culture is. I always say, the, the, you know what culture is the moment you say, that's not how we do this. We don't do it this way. The moment you say that, you've just identified a piece of culture. Because you've said, you've identified something that is deeper in the way that we do things, or it might be surface level. We don't dress this way, right? We don't just wear, I'm just making this up, tank tops, right? Uh, just coming in with tank tops and shorts on. That's not the way that we do it. You've just identified a piece of your culture. And culture is gonna help to shape the way that you think, the way that you believe, the way that you behave. All of these things work together. Any thoughts on these three? Thank you. Just that um, it's it's hard for for us, I think, to see, identify, and examine even for ourselves what our deep culture is. It's the the fish not noticing the water they're swimming in. Absolutely, absolutely. And I love that analogy of the fish not understanding that it's in water until it's out of the water, right? And that's part of our introspection is to think about when did I feel the most uncomfortable? When did something happen that I was like, uh-uh, that's I, I made a negative judgment about something? Those are gonna be indicators of culture that you may not have recognized. Thank you for that. Just to say that having been in the room when the social justice ministry team selected their theme for the year, mm. diving deeper so all may flourish, I'm really grateful because I think this picture shows us what our work is. Yes, thank you. It's so easy. Uh, and I say this as a former administrator and teacher for us to stay in that top part of the iceberg, right? We're gonna, it is important for us to celebrate everyone in the school. So we're gonna have a diversity day, right? Or we're gonna have a multicultural day. And it really consists of arts and crafts, music, dress. Tell us about the food that you eat or bring in the food, right? It's those really high level things that we just see. Think about when you visit a country, things that you see. But if you think about if you visited a different country outside of the United States, there's things that start to happen where you will be jolted because they're like, oh no, you need to do this, right? And you're like, oh, oh, okay. They've just given you a piece of culture, right? That's below the line. It's not something that you really knew, right? Oh no, the way that we do food here 
right? The way that we do food here is that if you finish all of your food, it means that you want more, right? Those are things that we wouldn't necessarily know until you're in that country and you're living or you're participating with that particular culture that you start to find things out that you may not have known before because it's the below the line. So why does all of this matter? It matters because our values and beliefs are deeply embedded and normalized. It means that as Americans, there's things that we just kind of take for granted, right? It wasn't until soccer kind of became big that we were like, oh, football isn't football, right? Football isn't just that little oblong thing that you throw, that it's actually this thing that you kick, right? Until that became big in the United States, we just thought football was football. And that's an example of how language, right? And it, was a, it took a minute for us to kind of click to say, oh, football can also be soccer. But that's not where we started. So it took a moment for us to shift. We got to know that they're deeply embedded and they're normalized. We have to know that it shapes the way that we see and understand the society that we live in. We create norms that we expect people to operate by. Think about just coming to church, right? Just coming to church. And I can say, uh, <laughs> being a, a, a my, I'm Baptist, I'm going to a Baptist church, and it used to be, you know, that you had to, you couldn't be dressing all skimpy-like, right? Don't come here looking like you just came from the club. And the elders would be upset. The, the back of the elders would be upset. And it had to be a shift within that community to say, if we really love people, they should be able to come however they are, right? And so you have that rhetoric changing, and it wasn't limited to the black churches, that was true across many churches, right? Don't come here looking like you just came from the club last night or that you just woke up or that you just walked off the street. We don't want you here. And then it becomes, well, is that what Jesus would do? Is that what Je would Jesus turn away somebody because they got on a, a short skirt, right? Or whatever the case may be. And so we had to start rethinking that. That's part of how we start to reshape our lens. What is it that we're doing? What is it that we're trying to do? It also shapes how we think people should behave, and that's the same thing, right? How you show up. You should look this way, you should be this way, you should act this way. The way that we determine how people behave is based on our own experiences, our own culture. And then finally, it's reflected in our behaviors. We will correct someone if they're not doing it the way that we think it should be done. We will offer correction and or we might be willing to make some changes. So this matters knowing what your values and beliefs are, knowing how they are um, acted out and embodied by you, knowing what your identity is and how that shapes the way that you see and view and engage in the world, knowing your culture. What is, the, what is American culture? What is my culture? When I'm at work, what's the work culture? When I'm at home, what's my home culture? All of those things are gonna give you keys and insights ultimately into what you have expectations for others around, even as you're trying to do this work. So I'm gonna give you an example, and I want you to finish my thought. Just yell out what you think it is, okay? So finish my thought, here we go. Peanut butter and, so look at that, <laughs> jelly. Night and day. Cookies and cream. <laughs> cream. Most folks say cream. I say cream. Up and down. East and west. You guys don't even know me, and you could finish my thought. Right? This is about how embedded beliefs, practices, things, our everyday lives are. You could be in another country, and instead of peanut butter and jelly, they might say, I'm making this up, peanut butter and noodles, right? And you'd be like, what? Who eats peanut butter and noodles, right? <laughs> oh, somebody does, okay. <laughs> but that might be, right? That, that's just so foreign that you're like, oh my gosh. What? This is what it means by deeply embedded and normalized. Normalized. These are the things that we typically say and do, okay? All right, so. All of this matters. I wanted to start here because I want you to be aware that messages are constantly coming at us, constantly. 
some things that we control and other things that are just really, really silent and, and not even visible to us. When my daughter, um, my youngest, was maybe eight, I think she was eight, um, but there was this, this uh, cartoon that came out, uh, Captain Underpants, and it was a movie. And she wanted to see that with her friends, and we took her to see it, and Kevin Hart played the little uh, black character, the little black boy that was in there, and I can't remember who, the, who played the little white boy, but they were friends. And it gets towards the end of the movie, and they're fighting, and not, they're fighting against the bad guy, right? The two friends are fighting against the black, bad guy. And the bad guy basically wants the kid, like he wants to get rid of laughter. That's the whole point, right? The bad guy wants to say there's no more laughter in the world. And they're fighting him to win against getting rid of laughter. And Kevin Hart's character says to um, the white friend as, as he was starting to lose his laughter, he says, no, no, don't lose. You know, you have to laugh, you have to laugh. And he goes, remember when we were in kindergarten and I had that funny hairdo? Well, the funny hairdo was an afro because they show him at the very beginning with a little afro. And I remember sitting there and being like, what the, right? Just like shock, like funny hairdo is your afro? And I turned to my husband, I'm like, did you just hear that? And he's like, uh, no, like what, what happened? And I was like, oh, buddy, he just said funny hairdo and it's an afro. And my kids, their hair is natural, right? So their hair will form an afro. And for me, that was a message that was really subtile, that your hair is funny. It's not beautiful, it's not right, but your hair is funny. And that is a subtle message that can easily be missed, not just by my black children, but by all children. To then think the natural way by which our hair grows is funny, it's abnormal, right? And so that's something, that's a message that kids, that people get that they're not even aware of, right? My own husband was like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. You know what I'm saying, right? Like literally was totally like, I don't know what you're talking about. What happened? Oh, oh, okay. And he didn't see it as like a, an alarm for me, but I saw it because I'm the one that does my children's hair, right? And have to talk through all the time, the beauty of it. So that's important for us to know. We have to know that as much as we read and we engage in conversations, that these messages can and will emerge at any time. You can just be watching, as I was, a children's movie. And there's a message. So they can emerge at any time. And lastly, our proximity to privilege. And I want to be clear about this idea of privilege. I'm not talking about white privilege. I'm talking about all kinds of privilege. It, being able-bodied is a privilege in this country. If anybody has been hurt and has been unable to walk and you needed to use a wheelchair at any point, we'll recognize the limitations of what's available and open to you, right? If you've had a, a, a bone that has broken and you have, there are limitations because we are an ableist society. We create things for right-handed people much more often than for left-handed people. So if you're a lefty, you have felt some of the sting Right, those scissors, <laughs> do anybody remember? If you know a lefty scissors in elementary school, were not made for you, unless you had those left scissors. So it's recognizing that privilege exists in many ways. If you're educated, there is privilege that comes with being educated. People will take your word over somebody else's word. So it's understanding for any of us who have had proximity to privilege, that we have to understand how we see and understand and, and engage in the world, sometimes we can support it and sometimes we can block it because we aren't paying attention to how these things, the way that we see and believe and understand influences then the way that I engage. Okay, so I have a couple of more slides. I'm gonna move quicker because I'm, yes, I'm running out of time. Okay, I'm good on time, okay. So this is a cycle that I created with this idea of being mindful um, of how this kind of functions. You have this idea of here, your beliefs and values, right? Ideas that you hold true, things that are important to you. And those two things come 
together. They're influencing each other. But those things then influence your attitude. It influences how you behave. And what's surrounding this is this idea of assumptions and associations that we make. The association being like peanut butter and jelly, right? The bias that we hold, images, experiences, people, our education, our miseducation, those things influence uh, whether uh, the implicit or explicit bias that we hold, having access to information or not having access, or having access to the incorrect or inaccurate information, and then ultimately this idea of priming. These things are all influencing and rotating through these pieces. So I'm going to show you a video, and I'm going to show you how this works. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for you to simply count how many passes the team in white makes. It's a basketball um, passing drill that they're doing. And I want to see if you can really pay attention to figure out if you come up with the same number that I come up with, OK? So I'm going to show this really quick video. And I think I forgot to put the sound on. Hopefully the sound will work. I don't think I have to do it for Google Slides. Okay, so I'm going to play this video, and then I want you to count how many passes the white team makes. Okay, here we go. Uh -oh. It's an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? So I'm going to go back because I kind of skipped over, oops, oops. I had skipped over this, this idea of priming for a reason. Because I said, you know, and priming. And then I kind of went on. I want to show you a video. That was priming what I just did to you. I asked you to look for something. You got hyper-focused on that thing. And you missed everything else. Right? That happens all the time. It happens all the time. It happens to us when we think about, um, what we hear on the news, things that uh, confirm, right? What, we're, what we believe or what we understand, it confirms it. So that's what we look for. When we think about violence, right? It's easy for us to think about um, when we hear, you know, the, the riots that took place um, for Black Lives Matter, right? And, and be like, yeah, that's a, without recognizing or looking for the pieces that said 97% of all the protests around Black Lives Matter last year were, were um, without violence without incident at all. So this is the idea of priming, is that if we don't look for the information, if we get hyper-focused on that one thing, that becomes the thing that we believe, it confirms our bias, that's a real thing, confirmation bias, and that's what we stick with. So how easily we can be deterred, right? That's what priming does. It's to have you not pay attention to other data, okay? So, I'm going to move past that. Let's get into interrupting myths, and I'm going to try to do this quickly. <laughs> um, I think that this, is, this goes parallel to this idea of how do you see and understand the world, and this is going to, I think, um, bring this even further. So often, when we think about, and I love, to, I love movies. I am a movie kind of gal, and I like action movies. I'm like a James Bond fan, right? Like, James Bond is like my thing. Um, but one of the things that you'll notice more often than not are that movies start with this kind of, there's some sort of challenge, right? Something is happening. A conflict ensues. And a hero emerges. And once that hero emerges, what happens? It's all better. We have our happy ending. 
And we see this all the time, but not just in movies, in how we talk about history. We talk about history from this, there was a challenge, right? Challenge happened. Slavery, that was a challenge. There was a conflict. People didn't want to be enslaved anymore. A hero emerged, Lincoln. And then things got better. And so it allows for us to be like, you know, we're great. We're, we, things got better. But that's not how it works. Yes, Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. But you do realize that was because we were starting to lose the war. Frederick Douglass had went to him early to say, listen, you know, slaves could serve and they could be sold. And he wasn't interested. But as we were losing, it became, this could be a way for us to win. And once that was signed, they were fighting. You had uh, um, slaves that were participating and became soldiers in the war. And yes, we did win. But what came soon after that? What came soon after the Civil War? You had a small piece of reconstruction, and then what emerged as a result of a backlash from that? Jim Crow, right? Jim Crow. And Jim Crow lasted for over decades to then come upon what? The Civil Rights Movement that moved us into the, right? Like, so we have all of these things that continuously lead up. There is not co challenge, conflict, hero, and then it's better. It actually never functions that way. Struggle has ensued from the beginning of time for the United States. We start with, even as we think about the civil rights movement, you know, Dr. King was the leader. Like that's who we, we post as the leader. And we even say, we even say like, you know, listen, he was a great leader. Do you guys realize that in the 60s, during polls showed that most white Americans, more than 60% of white Americans did not agree with the civil rights movement, did not agree with the way that it was moving forward and felt like it was disruptive. He was not a beloved man when he was alive in white, for white folks in particular. I always have to say, if he was, he wouldn't be dead. I always have to remind folks of that, right? He wouldn't be dead if he was. We look at, and we talk about it, and I can say for my own self, as a kid, learning about Rosa Parks, she sat down because she was tired. I literally learned it that way. And that's not a true statement. She was, <laughs> she was trained to be a resistor. She went to school to learn how to be a resistor. These are things that we don't know and we don't understand, but we simply see this as he was there, he led these folks, and they were able to do it. But what we don't realize is that before we even got to these protests, there was so much planning and strategy that the work behind the civil rights movement was not simply Dr. King, but there were a ton of grassroots efforts that brought this work forward. And so it's important for us to fill in the blanks. It's important for us to know that movements and black protests in, the, in, in general didn't just begin with the civil rights movement. It's important for us to know that struggle has ensued from the beginning, even before we were the United States, right? And you can, you can think of it from the Boston Tea Party, right? You could think of it from the, the American Revolution. There has been struggle. But when, when I'm, I'm, in this case, I'm racializing it from a struggle of BIPOC folks, Black, Indigenous, people of color, right? That struggle has been when Native, when, when folks, when Europeans came here, Native Americans were fighting to maintain, right? There has always been struggle. And that struggle has not gone away. The treaties that have been denied, that have been, um, kind of tossed aside for our Native American brothers and sisters. Those are things that they are still fighting to this day. Those aren't things that just went away. 
So we have to fill in the blanks with understanding that the work that we are doing around anti-racism, the work that we are doing in order to address racial injustice is work that is ongoing. We talk about Jim Crow, but we certainly don't talk about it of the North, right? Great PBS special, Jim Crow of the North, that if you haven't seen it, you should watch it. But it's recognizing that it wasn't just the South, right? And then lastly, um, strategy and grassroots efforts. This is not about a singular leader. And so often we want to reduce it to this one great person, this hero that emerged, when in reality, it was many people in many organizations working to bring about change. So that being said, I'm going to finish this out. This kind of gives a timeline where you can see more than 60% of our history was wrapped in the black enslavement. You have another 23% of our history that's wrapped in Jim Crow. And then we're coming into the age that we're in now. So you have to think about that in terms of how does that then build and sustain the ideologies that we hold. When you think of this timeline here, 69 to 2021 right now, you have people who were alive during this period of time. So it's not like those folks are gone. Oh, we're just, you know, like we just got a whole new, that's not the case. So we have to put this in terms of understanding that these systems are old, they are strong, the mental models are strong, and it's our work to constantly be uh, working to undo those things. That's our job, it's working to undo it. I describe it as kind of weight loss, that when you start to try to lose weight or get healthy, you start to do things, you're like, I'm not gonna have you know, that sugar, I'm gonna cut sugar out, I'm not gonna have that cookie, I'm gonna cut that cookie out. And, event, and, and when you first start, it's hard, right? It's really hard. And sometimes you want to go back and get that cookie. But once you kind of get over the hump of like, I'm going to let the cookies go, you start to see the results, right? You start to see the result. Oh, yeah, this is going well. I'm walking more. I, I could only walk two blocks. Now I can walk four. Now I'm walking four blocks. Now I want to get to six, right? So you can see those things happening. But what doesn't go away is that deep within our psyche, that desire for the cookie will reemerge. And then the question becomes, what do I do to mitigate that? So it's understanding that these things don't just go away, but it's paying attention that when it does emerge, what do I do with it? Okay, here we go, because I know I got, we gotta go. Yes, okay, and give you guys time for questions. So here's the things that I would offer to you. <laughs> Start with self, okay? Get clear about your values and how they show up. Identify how you are embodying them. And then what I think is always fun is to have someone else tell you what they believe your values are. And then talk with them about that. How did you get adventurous, right? How, why are you saying you think a value of mine is adventure? Because then you get to talk about what they see or hear you doing that is actually, excuse me, promoting, this is what I believe in value. Catch and reject deficit thinking and negative judgments. It happens to us all the time. I always caution people around this idea of don't judge. Judgment is a natural part of what we do. The difference is whether it's a positive judgment or a negative judgment. And when it's negative, you really want to work on why. Why is this negative? Why is this making me uncomfortable? Why am I pushing back against that? Why, why, why? That's what you're going to be asking. So you want to be curious. Be curious. Get curious. And the last two is um, coming from uh, Ibram Kendi's work um, around begin to identify racial inequities and how they manifest in its, in its intersectionality. Meaning that if you're talking about race, you will probably have to talk about gender. You will probably have to talk about economics. If you're, right? like, so there's intersections of how these things work and go together. And so you're going to start actively looking for and seeking out inequities and disparities. And you're going to identify policies and practices um, that are racist or inequitable. Um, and look to champion and bring forward policies and ideas that are anti-racist. Lastly, confront your own racist ideal. And that's not like, I'm not calling anybody in here, including myself, racist. I'm simply saying, 
as I said at the very beginning, we do not control the messages. Sometimes we do. <laughs> but oftentimes we don't control the messages that we receive. And so how does that influence the way that I hold beliefs, the way that I, my voting patterns might be, the way that all of these things that I might do that might justify maintaining inequity? And then consider how your choices and beliefs influence and impact your views. So I will now <laughs> open it up for questions. Go ahead and raise your hand if you have any questions and I'll bring you the mic or comments. Thanks so much for this. Um, I heard you reference your own engagement in a community of faith. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how your faith journey has influenced both your commitment to and your approach to this work. Great question. Yeah, I was raised, I mean, my mother um, in her retirement became a pastor um, and she's an educator. Uh, so we, you know, she was first at home mommy, then was a teacher administrator and in her retirement has <laughs> become a pastor. So um, we have been part of the church since before I was born. Um, and so <laughs> part of that is it influences and impacts my ability to try to slow down, um, listen with two ears, um, and be curious and empathetic. And, and I think those things are really important. What I've found and what I've talked with folks about a lot is this idea of um, <laughs> we have to be careful about, I heard you say something, you know, that, that, that's, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And instead be, be curious to ask questions. That's really interesting. Can you tell me more about, right? Um, how do I hold empathy for someone that isn't um, quite on this journey with us yet and be able to try to engage in ways um, that invites them into the conversation versus pushes them out of the conversation, right? It's shaming, it's terrible, it's all these other things. So working to really, I think, the tenets of, of who Jesus is, um, loving folks in spite of, um, but then also holding accountability. Because one of the things I always say is that, you know, Jesus was not without holding folks to accountability, right? Like, he wanted you to do things. He wanted you. So there is accountability that comes with that versus just, you know, I'm just going to love you, <laughs> right? I'm just going to love you to death. And, and whatever you do is fine. Um, that's, not, that's not real love, right? Love includes correction. Thank you for asking. Other thoughts, questions, wonderings? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think <laughs> what we know from the Bible is that it was never meant to be easy, right? Um, and I, there's no doubt the difficulty. I have friends who have made the choice not to get vaccinated and it's always a shock to me. And I'm just like, I don't, I don't understand it. <laughs> right out of, and one of the things, and that was, I think a perfect example of where I had to really be curious and not be like, that is the craziest thing, right? <laughs> like not to go down that path and instead just be like, okay, help me to understand your thinking around that. And as they were talking through kind of, here's what it is, I would offer, right? So the language that I use, I try to be really careful about. Um, 